Hey everyone, welcome to uh, day one, week four. We're starting a whole new week today. And for this week, this week's theme is gonna be random cell phone pick. So I know it sounds a little strange, but it isn't. And the idea behind it, aside from having a little bit of fun while doing these paintings, is that we don't control every single aspect of a painting, that we start to train ourselves also in finding uh, the worth of a painting in things that we weren't really thinking about being worthy of painting. So, the drill is kind of going again. <laughs> so what we're gonna do, it's a random act, like the random drilling that they're doing upstairs. Uh, what we're gonna try to do is have Danny blindly, she's, she's not looking at the cell phone, she's just gonna kind of pick one of the photos that I have on my cell phone. Now granted, I don't have like, you know, very strange photos in my cell. Like a, a lot of the pictures that I have are pictures that I would at some point eventually think of painting or, or I think of them as like, oh, that's so cool, I'll take a, I'll take a picture. But I haven't painted them yet. Uh, so she's gonna pick randomly an image and, uh, and I'm gonna paint that. Whatever, whatever comes out, I'm gonna paint. So what's cool is that I have no way to plan ahead what to do, but I'll do it nonetheless. And we'll see how that goes. And that's the theme for the whole week. Super simple, random pick from your cell phone and paint it. That's it. Okay, so this is totally random. Uh, let's see what painting we get today. And today was a selfie by <laughs> Manu, Azucar Manuelita. That's a former student of mine. She's crazy, crazy talented, very, very, very good artist. Um, and immediately I thought, okay, this is going to be a perfect example of, you know, why I love to uh, distort things. This is going to be just this awesome opportunity to take these somewhat seemingly regular shapes and just push them and make them quite irregular. As soon as I saw that, um, that selfie by Manuela, I, I thought, okay, this could be like a jack-in-the-box. I can make this head almost uh, separate, disjointed from the body. And the way I thought I could push that was by elongating the uh, neck a little bit. And because I had such a small space to describe the features, what was going to be the uh, portrait, really, it, it was just this almost like crevice uh, in the middle of the, uh, the hood. So I thought, well, I could actually make it feel like it's bigger than what the hood can actually hold. So, you know, the features would actually suggest that there was a bigger head, that they belong to like a bigger head. Um, but since it's kind of um, strangled, it's actually kind of uh, really making a ton of pressure in her, in, in, in her face, I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to take all that pressure that is up there and then just shrink it in the bottom. And I could have, you know, how much I decided to shrink it was, you know, the cool part about the painting. But I did decide to just, you know, all these little folds and, and kind of wrinkles that were basically her neck. I, I just pushed them closer together and I made like an accordion of sorts. And those folds are in the photo. Uh, but I wanted to see if I could you know, take that and say, okay, this is super cool. I'm going to change so much the outer contour that the inner structure is not going to be represented. So I, I thought that was very, very cool. Um, usually when you do folds and specifically in the body, what you're trying to do is even though, let's say it's a sleeve, even though you're painting a sleeve, you are painting the arm underneath the sleeve because it is the structure, the underlying structure, uh, of that arm that's actually causing those superficial breaks and folds in the sleeve to be described. So uh, if you want to be very traditional about it, you're always trying to find the cause of those folds and actually find that underlying structure. But it's actually very, very fun in painting to forget, you know, about all of those rules and say, well, I know that there's a neck there and I know that there's a maybe a bigger head underneath but let me see if I can push it just a little bit let me see if I can push these contour lines just a little close together a little bit close together uh, and make it feel just a bit weird and the cool thing is as soon as you accept that you're going to enter this realm of 
not just painting, you know, in a naturalistic way uh, because you want to represent nature, you want to faithfully represent nature. But once you accept that you can start to take chances and just make really kind of fun choices, for me, it's been just the... <laughs> you know, the, the door of happiness just opened in my painting because it means that I can do whatever I want. A lot of times people think that because you start doing stuff from imagination or you let your imagination just kind of run a little wild and, you know, change as much as you want. And, you know, you don't have to push things or you can push things to an extreme that's, you know, I don't know, only limited by your own, again, your own imagination. Uh, the degree in which you push it, it's just totally up to you. And I've pushed in a ton of my paintings just tons of distortion uh, because, again, it is just insanely fun for me. I, this is one thing that I've, I've always felt, you know, and I, I think I always had clarity of this when I was younger. It's just that I love paintings that make me feel this little shot of adrenaline and they just take your breath away. And you just kind of gasp, oh my God, that is so cool. I love that. I want to feel that. And I remember the exact feeling of that when I was a kid, when I, you know, first saw like Neil Adams Batman, or when I saw uh, Frazetta paintings that I actually was able to see when I was quite young. I think I was probably seven or eight when I first saw my, um, my first Frazetta paintings. So I, I think I, my whole life, I've just kind of, uh, <laughs> I've wanted to pursue that feeling of coolness. And every single painting, every single painter that I really like today and that I've liked for the last, I don't know, 25 years, maybe more, 30 years, has to, has to. They, they have to just do exactly that. They have to take my breath away. If it doesn't do that, then I just feel it's, um, it's almost like forgettable painting. Um, but in that sense, when, when I opened this door for the slightest manners of distortion, I started remembering that, okay, that's why I loved, uh, let's say, Phil Hale when I was you know younger and I was looking at like Vertigo uh, covers. And, you know, Phil is, aside from being like <laughs> just an insanely good painter, he was, he was incredible at doing um, cover work. It was just impactful. Uh, powerful. You read it very quickly. You know, everything that a comic book cover has to do. And, you know, it wasn't just your Marvel Spider-Man cover. It was just dark. It was really, really dark. And I, I loved that. I, it, it just felt real. It was a, a story, you know, a fantasy story, a comic book story, but that was very, very grounded. And then it felt that, you know, never in my life I thought that I could walk down the street and, you know, meet the Hulk. But in, in Vertigo stories, um, it, it, there was a sense of, of realism, of grounded realism that, it, that was very, very, very cool. So uh, for me, Phil Hale is just, you know, <laughs> he's, he's one of my heroes and just childhood heroes. And again, if, if I started thinking of why I find not only Phil Hale, but painters that I think have impacted my life profoundly, and I'll go back to, um, to Ruprecht von Kaufmann. Uh, Ruprecht is, and I wasn't being hyperbolic, I really do think he is the best painter in contemporary painting today. There is no doubt in my mind. He is the most exciting painter in contemporary painting. Um, I don't know if contemporary painting is willing to see in him everything that I see in him and everything that he offers to painting um, because his paintings have a certain narrative and they do look illustrative in the best sense of the world. I would never use illustration in a pejorative manner. Uh, he does tell stories. He does want to uh, conduct his paintings and tell stories. And I find that, you know, fascinating. And I applaud that. Um, but Ruprecht has this one particular painting. Um, and I think he has his, this whole story about uh, these Polish guys in the gym or in the shower and how he did it from memory. But this painting really just changed the way I, I do painting. And I can trace it to this exact painting. And one thing when you are attending to any drawing class or any painting class from life is people tell you, you can't stay, like let's say you have a frontal pose. And your teacher would usually say, and I've said it too, 
Um, don't stay in one side of your contour too much. If you have one shoulder, you have to travel to the other side and look at the other shoulder and ask yourself, okay, this one shoulder is doing this thing. Where's the other shoulder? What's it doing? Uh, this biceps is doing this thing. Where's the other bicep? This pectoral muscle is doing this thing. Where's the other one? So you have to travel from one side to the other. You can never stay within one side because you run the risk of your figure then becoming totally disproportionate. When you try to match the two, um, the two hemispheres, if you aren't just insanely good uh, at drawing, uh, chances are, and this is like, you know, bound to happen, that you're never going to be able to make one side of your body correspond to the other. Now, this is something I had heard all my life. This is something that I had passed on to students in drawing class. And this is like one of the foundations of drawing. Just check your axis and check your symmetry, you know. And suddenly, I see this painting by uh, Ruprecht and... It's insane. I mean, this guy is falling apart. It's it, one of the shoulders doing one thing, then the other one is doing another thing, and it's the one has one proportion, the other one's bigger. Uh, one pec muscle is, is larger, the other one's smaller. Uh, the rib cage just totally, you know, almost inflates uh, on one side, and the other one, the other side is collapsing. I mean, nothing, nothing made sense in the way he depicted form. But here comes the cool thing: when I saw it. I gasped. I was like, that is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life, period. And that's when I realized, wow, this is, it's, this is such a powerful tool to be able to take things that you're not supposed to do and just push them and really, really push them. And you have to put yourself like in a terrible situation, an uncomfortable situation as a painter where you know you're doing something that is off. But you're also telling yourself, okay, this is a challenge. You are doing something that's wrong. Make it work. Make it work. And I just love when artists acknowledge that they're doing something that they're not supposed to, but they are going to find their way. They're going to just, you know, hack at this painting and just make it work. And of course, Ruprecht is one of the most talented painters I've ever, ever seen in my life. And he's able through his knowledge of anatomy and his, his, his drawing ability and the control he has with his painting to say, okay, I found a way. When I saw that, when I saw that particular painting, I was like, I can do anything. I can do whatever I want when I'm painting. I mean, it has to make sense. I have to make it work, but I can do whatever I want. And I loved it. From then on, I was like, there's no reason that I have to follow nature. I have to start from nature. I can celebrate nature. I can be moved by nature. I could be moved by tears. But then I could say, okay, now I can do whatever I want. I know that this is my starting point. Now it's up to me. Now, now I have to do a painting. Because if there's a tree, a painting will never be able to communicate the treeness of a tree more than the tree itself. And it's ridiculous. To think that a painting could replace the nature of the thing it's representing, it's absurd. It's like that Mark Tanzi painting that's absolutely brilliant, where the woman is just throwing the, uh, the flowers away that she had just painted, and she wants to keep the painting, because Mark Tanzi is just a genius. But no, no, we're supposed, in, in my mind, we're always just supposed to start from nature. You know, a ton of people have asked, no, 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 show us your reference picture. Show us your reference picture. We want to see how, you know, how off you are or how, you know, you interpreted those colors. In the end, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. It's a painting. And when we start judging it just in terms of how far it strays from the reference photo or how close we can get, then I think we do painting a disservice. Uh, because a painting is a painting in itself. It's a whole exercise in itself. So who cares? Who cares if you totally distort it? Now, distortion should be a thing that you want. It shouldn't be a thing that just happens. And ideally, you have reasons to uh, distort. And hopefully, those reasons are grounded in nature. So they are things that you saw in nature and you just wanted to amplify. You thought that through painting, you could emphasize those aspects. How much do you want to emphasize them? You could go nuts. You could go absolutely nuts and, and do, you know, do something like that Ruprecht painting. Uh, you could be a little more subtle, you know, and you could be like Michael Taylor, for example, that he has a little bit of like early Freud in him, but it, he is a, a very, very traditional, um, almost Renaissance painter in a way. 
Um, and and I, I always tell people that the degree in which you decide to emphasize those things that move you, that is your style. You know, if you want to call it style. I, I love the Italian word, the old Italian word, maniera, uh, manner. I like that one a lot better to refer to style because style ends up being an absolutely superficial thing that anyone can copy. That's why so many comic book artists speak about in style and they have to learn, you know, her style, his style, or, you know, her style of inking. Um, illustrators nowadays, it's like, yeah, this is a James Jean style. Uh, this is a Tomer Hanukkah style. Um, I'm very, very careful about using style because it, it has to generate it into speaking only about the surface quality of an image. So I like to speak better of manner. And as I said, you know, the um, degree in which you are moved by something and your decision to emphasize how much, whatever stimulus you've seen in nature, how much that has moved you and how you um, translate that into paint, that is you. That is essentially the way you work and who you are as an artist. So let's say if you're working and you say, wow, she has like super rosy cheeks. Like, you know, it's maybe a, a fair per person with rosy cheeks. And if you want to push that, show me, show me. Sometimes when I see myself, I'm like, oh my God, my ears are like bright red. It's like, how bright red do I feel them? Like wh when my ears get like, like super red, they like sting and hurt. So I want to say that through painting. So if I want to, if, if I want to paint them with like just pure cad red, that's awesome. That's like speaking about how they feel and how much they're burning, for example. But that's up to me. That's up to me to decide. And maybe somebody else sees my bright red ears and say, well, they're not that bad. You know, they're just a little bit warmer and they just paint like a fairly regular portrait. And they didn't emphasize that. Uh, but again, it's up to every one of us to decide where we want our painting to be, where we want it to live. And I always tell people, yeah, you need to learn how to draw, you need to learn how to paint, but the foundations of drawing and painting are so, so simple, are so, so very simple that, you know, even for me, speaking about paint, I can't speak of like <laughs> advanced painting. I, I just always speak about the very basics of painting. You know, even after 20 years, when I see something I like, it's because the basics of painting or the, the drawing fundamentals are right. It's not because the new artist is doing like an insane thing with paint. It's just that they are using those very basic fundamentals in a way that, you know, speaks about their stories, that they can adjust those fundamentals to communicate their stories. And I find that fascinating. Um, so whenever you're thinking about how to push something to make it yours, first of all, stop thinking about making something yours. If you're honest when you're painting, your work is always going to feel your own. So don't worry about those things. But if you want to understand how to formally start to have your paintings reflect how you feel about the things you're looking at, push them a little bit. Emphasize them a little bit more than what you would normally. If you want to speak about control, then yeah, okay, go nuts with control. Like go crazy with the amount of control that you want to have in your image. That's totally fine. But if you can uh, release a little bit of the, uh, of the control that you want to have in your image and just push and see where, you know, that push is going to take you, just go ahead, give yourself a chance. And, and again, try not to distort for the sake of distorting. Um, try to have a reason behind it. And hopefully it's, again, an honest reason that comes from something that genuinely moves you or excites you and see where that takes you. Uh, this, is, this is what we're going to try to do um, in, in this week of, of random cell phone pics because I don't really know what I'm going to paint until I see it. And until I sit down, I, I, you know, first couple of strokes, I'm telling myself, okay, what kind of painting can I do with this? And, uh, and that's very, very exciting for me. So let's see what uh, tomorrow brings us. And uh, that's it for today. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.